Good evening, everyone. I'm Robert Summercrast, Dean of Virginia Tech's Business School, the Pamplin College of Business, and I want to welcome all of our students and other audience members to tonight's event, the Sustainability Leadership Lecture featuring Omar Asali. We'll be introducing Mr. Asali in just a couple of minutes. Now, I'll bet that many people in the audience know very little about the history of Pamplin. The college is named for two individuals, Robert B. Pamplin Sr. and his son, Dr. Robert B. Pamplin Jr. That history is important, especially during Ethics Week, because the Pamplins aren't just well known for their success in business or for their generosity, they're well known for their ethical practices. We have another businessman with high ethics as tonight's special speaker. Mr. Ossoli has agreed to provide some remarks, but he told me just a few minutes ago, in fact, that he's really much more interested in answering your questions. So help us out, uh, ask some questions, make a comment, just type into the chat right now or at any time, maybe while he's speaking and you get some ideas. Um, I've gotten some questions in advance. And so I'll be pulling from the chat as well as from those uh, pre-submitted questions once we get to the Q&A feature. Now, I wanna turn things over to Alyssa Catlin. Alyssa is a junior majoring in BIT with a minor in organizational leadership. She's also a member of the Pamplin Environmental Coalition and the Pamplin Leadership Development Team. This semester, she's working on a project that'll make recommendations to Virginia Tech's Office of Sustainability. Alyssa, could you please introduce our speaker? Yes, thank you, Dean Summercast. Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending the Leadership Sustainability Lecture. My name is Alyssa Catlin. It is my pleasure to introduce to you today our speaker, Mr. Omar Osley. Mr. Osley serves as Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of RANPAC, and he's also the Founder and Chairman of One Madison Group. Prior to One Madison Group, he was the CEO, President, and a member of the Board of Directors of HRG Group, Inc. He is currently a member of the Virginia Tech Foundation Board, and he has been a past Wells Fargo Distinguished Speaker in 2017, prior to his new role as CEO of RANPAC. Mr. Osley also graduated from the Accounting and Information Systems Department in Pamplin in 1992. He also received an MBA from Columbia Business School. We are very excited to welcome Mr. Osley back to campus in 2021 and for our current students to be able to hear him speak to us today. He also encourages questions, so please share your questions in the chat. But without further ado, please welcome Mr. Omar Osley. Uh, thank you, Alyssa. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, quite excited to, uh, to be talking to you today. Um, as Alyssa and Robert mentioned, uh, I will make brief comments uh, and then uh, really look forward to, uh, to the questions and answers. Um, you know, sustainability is a very important topic. And, uh, and when I heard that the school is focused on it and, and doing a, a number of series of discussions uh, this week, I, I was really thrilled um, and just to give you a sense, I wish I can tell you I was thinking about sustainability back in 1992 when I graduated from tech. I think I was thinking about other things than doing Blacksburg. Uh, but in the last five years, uh, I really started spending a lot more time uh, on climate related issues and sustainability. And I'll take you back to maybe five years ago when China, uh, for me at least, uh, in, in particular highlighted that they will no longer accept the waste and, and, and the garbage from the United States and from Western Europe um, because of pollution issues. If you look at supply chains before that for a number of years, China was the manufacturer for the world, making finished goods, shipping those to the US, to Western Europe, et cetera. And these same ships and barges were coming back uh, to China carrying a lot of waste uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of plastic, paper and, and, and cans, etc. Given the pollution that China endured, uh, five years ago, China talked about not accepting that waste anymore and started banning getting, uh, you, you know, uh, that, that uh, those substrates back into their country. 
And to me and my team, this was a really important uh, sort of milestone. A, it's a big change in how supply chains work. Um, and then secondarily, we felt there's gonna be quite a bit of shift in how we all think about you know, our environment. Uh, at the end of the day, a little bit, you know, waste was out of sight, out of mind, uh, going you know, thousands of miles away. And now we have to deal with it uh, within our shores. So we started doing a lot of work to try to understand you know, how supply chains work, et cetera. And we all know up to that point, uh, supply chains are very linear. So we all have the mentality of take, make, and waste. You know, we take resources from the planet, we make products, we use them, then we uh, dispose of them. And a, a big change that happened in the last five years was going to be a lot more focus on circular economy, where we reuse, recycle, and reduce our footprint. So my team and I started uh, investing a lot of time understanding how that all plays out and how can we help to move to that circular economy and help you know, deploy a more sustainable footprint, if you will. And, and we focused on the packaging industry at the time. And our conclusion was uh, some substrates, in particular aluminum and paper, are going to be the winners and that plastics is going to be on the wrong side of, of history. So we started investing more and more in, uh, in building a business that is solely focused on recyclable and recycled uh, material. And, and to me, this was really my foray and my introduction into sustainability. And let me, let me just take a step back uh, because sustainability means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. It's a very broad concept. Uh, it includes circular economy, like I talked about, and materials. But I think in most cases, when you talk about climate-related uh, issues and sustainability, most people think about energy. Most people think about power production. They think about water and, and, and water management and waste. I think fewer people in general think about materials that we use. And to me, that's why uh, my team and I focused more in that area. So if you look at areas like power production, electrification, electric vehicles, these are all very important areas when it comes to sustainability. But there is less traffic focused on, on materials, on material science, and sort of the circular aspect that I talked about in terms of how we dispose uh, of this material. So that was a big impetus for uh, why we focused on that. Um, and, and just to give you a sense, again, in terms of my thoughts on, on the importance of sustainability and climate change, if we all go back in the last 10 or 15 years, I think the biggest trend we've seen globally has been digitization of business. So whether that's cloud computing, whether that's the streaming that we all do for our entertainment or even the e-commerce activity uh, that we deploy on our devices, I think for those 15 years, that has been a huge trend and will continue in the near future. My personal view is in the upcoming uh, decade, the most important theme globally is gonna be around climate and sustainability. So this is why I was excited to be, to be part of this session and part of this discussion uh, to talk to you, answer your questions, because I think what we are discussing today is potentially the most important topic that I think we will uh, experience in this uh, upcoming decade. And as I said, sustainability means different things to different people, which by the way, is part of the problem. So academic institutions, you know, NGOs, governments, et cetera, and private sector, we all need to work together to define things better, to have certain standards in place, so that there is less greenwashing and everybody is, is trying to execute you know, the same plan and frankly achieve a better uh, outcome for, uh, for our planet. Um, as I mentioned, materials, material science is an area that's really important for me and my company and sort of uh, the businesses that we're looking at. And let me spend just a sec what I mean by, by sort of material and material science. 
Uh, we are very focused on the full life cycle. So the beginning of life, the useful life and the end of life for the substrates that we use. Um, what is happening is today, when you look at innovation in the last five, six or seven decades, we were very creative as society, as business, uh, in innovation to come up with materials like plastics that have a very short useful of life, but have a very long durability. And that durability is the asset that we thought we're creating. The problem is when it comes to environmental impact, um, that's also the liability. So where we spend time is thinking about, uh, you know, materials that end of life, it composts or biodegrades, or it's easily recycled, not just recyclable. And there's a big distinction between what is recyclable and what actually gets recycled. So those are areas that we think there's gonna be uh, tremendous innovation. Uh, and that's what we're focused on. We're also focused on beginning of life where maybe it's less about fossil fuels and petrochemical complex and more about natural ingredients, plant-based starch based, uh, in many cases, maybe protein based, but items that are renewable and natural that we think are, are, are better for the environment. So uh, there's a lot to cover. Uh, I think we as society are a little bit behind the curve. And I think this is why it's important this decade to really catch up in terms of our investments in, in sustainable and circular uh, economy. And I think, you know, that's going to be a great space for many people that are want to focus on it. And, and part of thinking about the climate and the environment, I'm sure you guys all hear about, you know, ESG opportunities. So the environment is one aspect uh, that's really important. And my team and I spend a lot of time sort of focused on that. But in addition to environment, it's thinking about, you know, social and governance aspects and how business uh, can help society, can help contribute um, to sort of certain issues and resolve certain issues. I, I think business can play a big role um, in addressing income equality, in addition to addressing climate change. Uh, I think business can play a big role uh, in addressing, uh, you know, social injustice and, and many of the issues that, um, you know, are, are, are impacting our world today. I think business has a nice role to play there beyond addressing just sustainability and, and environmental impact. Uh, you know, the school of thought in, in, in many corporations in the last three, four or five decades has been around Milton Friedman's, you know, thinking that companies basically and corporations work for shareholders. Um, and I think uh, that type of notion is gonna be misguided in the next decade or two. Because uh, I think companies really work for a broader set of stakeholders. So companies that I think are just going to maximize shareholder return, I'm not sure are going to be the winners in the long term. I believe companies going forward are going to need to for sure deliver returns to shareholders, but they're going to need to do right by employees, by community, uh, by society. They need to be better corporate citizens. So this whole notion that you're hearing about uh, with corporations really thinking more about stakeholders rather than shareholders, uh, I think is a very important trend. And I think sustainability and climate issues are, if you will, uh, a piece of, of, of that trend. So it's an area that is frankly very exciting. It's an area that's still nascent. Uh, it's an area where there's gonna be a lot of change uh, but I think this is going to be the area uh, of maybe the most uh, impact and influence in terms of global economy uh, in the upcoming uh, in the upcoming decade. So with that, look, I always enjoy hearing uh, your questions to to know what's on the students' mind. Let me let me pause there, and maybe we can open it up for uh, for Q and A. Omar, uh, thanks so much for being here and for those remarks. Um, I'm glad you're uh, asking our audience to contribute some questions. We've got a couple coming into the chat now, and I hope we'll get some others. Um, let me let me start with one. Actually, there's a couple that came um, in before we started, and they deal with uh, the culture in a company and the role of the CEO. So maybe you can talk from personal experience. So. 
is it fair for us to blame the CEO if the employees of a company do bad things? So they cheat to get ahead or that we find out they're prejudiced against certain groups or they're, they're accused of harassment. You know, is it fair to blame the CEO and conversely, um, if we aren't hearing that uh, sort of misconduct by the company's employees, um, do we give credit to the CEO? Uh, let me address the first part about is it fair to blame the CEO? I, I think it is fair to say tone is set at the top. Uh, CEOs are very impactful when it comes to, you know, setting the culture, um, values of a company. Uh, I, I think um, the way I think about it, companies are like any team sport. It's made up of a lot of individuals. The CEO is the captain of that team. To say that the CEO, he or she are responsible for every employee's activity, uh, in some cases, maybe a misguided activity, uh, strikes me like a bit too much. I think CEOs are responsible for setting the tone, setting the values. If there are inappropriate activities, they're responsible to address them. They're responsible to not create a reward system that rewards, if you will, bad actors and bad behavior. So if one event happens, I wouldn't blame the CEO. If a series of events happens and there is a pattern and a trend of repeatability, then I think the CEO might be, he or she might be more accountable. Um, on, on the last part of your question of the absence of any sort of misdeeds, et cetera, is that a reward for the CEO? I think it's very tough to prove negatives. So the fact that we don't know of any you know, misdeeds, et cetera, I don't think that's necessarily uh, you know, uh, a check and in support of the CEO. Uh, but I think instead of focusing on specific uh, events, I would focus more on culture, on trends, on pattern of behavior, and how CEOs set the tone at the top. CEOs are very, very important in companies globally, and they can set the direction and the tone for the company. Okay, let's let's go in a really different direction here. Um, our students are, uh, like the rest of the world, are thinking about COVID-19 and the pandemic we're living through. Um, so obviously, the, you know, it's a terrible thing, but changes are coming from it. What do you think is the most positive thing that's come from or that will come from the COVID-19 pandemic we're living through? You know, I, I think as it relates to business, um, I think many CEOs I talk to are surprised with how effective we can be, frankly, in this, in this format. Um, if you asked me before COVID, uh, if I thought I could run a company well and do so virtually other than the employees that show up in our plants to make and, and produce the product, I would have been skeptical that the office people could do things virtually. I, I think we in business, uh, like you, Robert, in education are learning that you could do a lot virtually, whether it's conducting business, you, you know, running uh, educational institutions and classes. And I think that is a good change that I think will have um, quite a bit of, of benefit going forward, uh, where the workforce and the workplace are gonna change, where I think, frankly, cities, uh, may change to adapt to that new reality. Uh, I think we're going to have maybe less concentration of activity and activity that's more spread out and dis dispersed. And, and, and to me, that's, that's exciting. And to be honest with you, um, uh, post-COVID, uh, I think anybody who's going to behave uh, exactly the same way as they did pre-COVID uh, is probably being somewhat naive. So COVID did change us. It did change the way we do things. Uh, but I think in terms of the impact on, on the workplace, the impact on how to do things, the impact on productivity, uh, you, you know, there's a lot of positive changes there that I think businesses can embrace. You know, for me, I think any company going forward that is going to demand all of their employees to be present in an office five days a week, I think they're going to be at a disadvantage. We're going to have a hybrid 
type arrangement, I think, between work from home and work from the office. And if CEOs don't embrace that, I suspect there might be some serious loss of talent because the talent will go to where there is a bit more flexibility. So, so I think there's a lot of exciting changes, um, you, you, you know, that we're going to see in business. Okay. Well, I can tell you that there's been a lot of changes at Virginia Tech in the, the <laughs> last 12 months, and our maybe our students who are graduating are going to be better employees for for you and others because of their uh, experience working through this pandemic. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, so you, you mentioned the importance of the digitization of biz, business, and we've got a, a question about that coming up. So uh, everything in business has a cost. Um, as far as digitization of business goes, what would you say are the biggest costs that come with the implementation of this form of business? It, it, it's really, it's implementing the technology um, so whether you're talking about enterprise software, whether you're talking about customer relationship management software, financial software, um, it, it can get quite costly if you are a global company to implement these technology solutions. Now, I think what businesses sometimes miss is in order to digitize, you have to spend the capital to buy these solutions and to sort of implement the right technology. In order to be a truly digital company, technology alone is not enough. So there is a cost to buy and implement the technology and that can be expensive to address the question that, that, that was raised. But the other side of the equation is human capital and training your employees to embrace and use that technology. I've seen a number of situations where companies buy the latest and greatest technology, but then it's not embraced by employees. The employees are not trained. And then that gets you to the same place as if you didn't have that great technology. So I think a key thing in technology is thinking about both software and hardware that you're buying, and then the training and education that you need to have for your employees and workforce so that that technology is utilized the right way. And I think if companies do both of these things, uh, the results are faster, more nimble, and frankly, more accurate you, you know, business decisions and much better execution at these companies. Okay. Uh, here, here's one that came in that uh, seems to be a follow-up on that question. And the, the real question of it is, um, what steps are, do you believe that corporations and other businesses are taking and must now take in order to fully achieve the goal of sustainability and protecting the environment? So maybe, maybe not just thinking brand pack, but more generally, are you seeing companies take these steps now and what are some things they need to be doing? I think if you look at the environment, and as I said, we are focused on the material piece. If you just divide it to the key segments, there is energy usage, there is you, you know, power utilization that all factories also have. Uh, so energy also obviously encompasses um, transportation. There is resources that are being used. So think about water, think about other, other ingredients that any, any business would, would need. Um, and then there is the carbon footprint of the business. Uh, as well as, you, you, you know, the recycling and, and waste and disposal of materials that I, that I discussed uh, sort of in my opening remarks. I think companies that want to be sustainable have to address all of the above. Uh, you can't just say, I'm going to focus on one aspect as a company and ignore the rest. So your energy efficiency is important. Your uh, power utilization is important. Your water utilization is important. Your waste management is important. Same with your carbon footprint. What we are witnessing from companies today, and we at Rampac will be issuing our ESG report uh, in the next week or so, are companies making targets and goals along all these lines to tell the world sort of 
their areas of focus and what they are doing. And I think companies need to address all of these because collectively, um, that's what's impacting the climate. You know, sometimes there is a misnomer that the most important thing maybe is our carbon footprint. I think all these factors are very important. Carbon footprint is absolutely important, but I think all these other factors are, are just as important and companies need to address them. Um, and, and there's a lot of technology and a lot of innovation across all these different metrics that I think will make businesses, um, you know, a lot more efficient and will reduce their impact on, on, on the climate if, if businesses embrace these in a rational way. Uh, here's one that came in, uh, I guess, maybe uh, related to your statement about the uh, ESG impact report that Randpack will be uh, issuing soon. Um, one of our audience members wants to know what your view is of assurance on companies' sustainability reports. Um, do you see assurance providing any value to the credibility of sustainability reporting? I, I think whether it's, it's assurance, whether it's rating agencies, whether, and, and this is a piece that I touched on a little bit in my comments, I think we need more standardization and we need companies when they're disclosing things for all of us, frankly, as just consumers and customers to compare apples to apples rather than apples to oranges. So that way, when you're looking at an ESG report from company A and company B and company C, it's, it's a little bit easier to compare and contrast. No different, by the way, than how we compare financial results. We have GAAP standards, we have international accounting standards, and companies follow those. And it makes the comparisons easier for users of these financial stat standards or statements. We, we need to do the same when it comes to uh, sustainability and ESG reporting. And to me, uh, regulators can play a role in that. Um, certainly some NGOs can set some standards and play uh, a role in that. Um, and I think that would be something that would be really beneficial. So, so customers are more informed and can make decisions in a transparent way. And I think that's something that is gonna happen and I expect you're going to see some meaningful changes uh, in, in the upcoming years on that front, given, uh, you know, my, my own prediction that I think climate and sustainability related issues are going to be so critical this upcoming decade. I think we're going to see some of those changes uh, implemented, not in the distant future. Here's a question about implementing those changes that you were just talking about. <clears throat> and uh, one of our uh, audience members is wondering if companies aren't reluctant to implement sustainable strategies because they believe it, this could drive up costs. And so if they are competing against companies that um, don't have that same goal or to the same degree, um, this is going to put them at a competitive disadvantage in terms of cost at least. So how do you solve that dilemma? And is there a role for government in this? Or is there another way to encourage companies to adopt sustainable strategies that could be more expensive? I think that, that, that this is a critical question. Uh, to embrace sustainability in a real way comes at a cost. I would make a distinction here between near-term financial results and long-term financial results. So I believe they could be impacting companies' financial results in the near term, but I believe long-term, those investments, if you will, are gonna be very accretive as customers demand it. I think government certainly can play a role. Government could create tax incentives, um, tax credits for certain sustainability efforts. They could lower cost of capital, guarantee loans and, and help corporations that are doing the right thing for society. So there is a role there. But I would say a very good example along these lines is what happened in Western Europe. If you look at countries in Ger like Germany, Netherlands, the Nordic region, they are very advanced on sustainability topics. It's because the customer wants it. It's because the employees want it. Regulators want it. 
the board of directors and CEOs wanted, there was an alignment in terms of philosophy and mission. And these companies continue to invest, in some cases temporarily, you know, costs went up. But in the long term, the companies that are absorbing these costs are winning more and more. And imagine if you fast forward, as this topic becomes more important, it's very short-sighted for certain companies not to invest behind it, not to absorb the costs, and then end up being either big pollutants or having very damaging uh, you know, impact on the environment. That's not what customers long-term are gonna support. You know, I, I think the climate topic is gaining more traction and I don't wanna get into sort of the political people have different views. There are certain aspects of it that are just very visible. I have yet to meet one person who told me we don't have a plastic pollution problem on our planet. So there are things that are just visible for us that, that we must address. And if that requires a little bit more long-term thinking and absorbing a bit more costs up front, I think that is a very smart allocation of capital. Okay. I've got a question that'll take you back to your time at Virginia Tech, perhaps. Uh, so uh, we've got a question about whether there were organizations or activities or classes that you had while you were at Virginia Tech that had some influence on the, um, the focus that you've got in your career now on sustainability. Anything that uh, influenced you if, you if you think back to Virginia Tech? I, 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 really, I really cannot say that it impacted my thinking back then about sustainability. Frankly, I don't know whether I was not paying attention to classes in, in, in Virginia Tech 30 years ago or whether the topic was a lot smaller. Uh, I, I did not really focus on sustainability 30 years ago. I think I focused more uh, clearly as, as a student at Pamplin on all the relevant business courses I took. And those were powerful tools that I continue to use today, whether it's accounting, finance, etc. cetera. Um, what I do regret, given the breadth of the university and my advice to students today, as I watch a lot of innovation, a lot of science occurring in material science, in engineering, in computer science, is not taking advantage of some of these courses, given the breadth of the university, that I think could have had a pretty big impact. And if I were a student today uh, at Tech, I would certainly be venturing into some of these other classes that really brought in your perspective. It's incredible to me how post-graduation as you enter real life, you know, you're connecting dots of different things you've learned. And some of them are things that when you learned back at school, maybe you didn't have a full appreciation of what that would mean, but down the road, you're like, oh, I remember this or that. You do slightly more research, you connect the dots. It, it gives you an opportunity. So if I were a student again in, in Pamplin, I would really try and take a few courses in, in some of these other colleges that I think offer you tremendous insight into all the innovation that's going on in the world today. Yeah, it sounds like good advice. And um, Omar, I can tell you, I was on the faculty 30 years ago and we didn't have in Pamplin and certainly didn't have a lot at the university classes that dealt with sustainability. So. Definitely understand your uh, your perspective on that, mm -hmm. and you know. But today there is increasing emphasis on working in teams and coming at problems from multiple perspectives. So, just as you're recommending, uh, I think there are more opportunities for our students there. Absolutely. Let me, let me let me take a couple of questions and combine them together. Um, so, is it possible? for a business that has a history of being unethical, is it possible to make up for the past? And sort of related to that and more specific to you, Omar, if you were trying to expand Rampack through an acquisition, would you consider acquiring a company that's struggling, perhaps because it's trying to pay off a very large fine that had been assessed because of a pattern of breaking the law? Look, businesses, as I've said, are, are really a collection of human beings. It's, it's a team of individuals. So is it possible 
for for teams to change if they had certain missteps historically to do better and, and, and going forward I, I think it's possible when you talk about ethical lapses um who, who who did it why you know putting it in context becomes very very important if if it's the same people that are still in charge and the company still have the same culture and values and they haven't learned lessons i would be very careful um so i don't think we need to pass permanent judgment on businesses you know businesses are living organisms they de they develop they evolve they change but I would focus a lot on the people in charge, on what tone they're trying to set and make assessments going forward. When you talk about us doing acquisitions and uh, companies that maybe have had unfortunate events in the past, would we consider in investing in them? We would if we feel these issues have been addressed. If these issues have not been addressed, then absolutely we wouldn't. Uh, acquisitions are not just buying companies or buying technology or buying customers. You are going to be embedding a whole host of people and new people into your own human capital. And, and the ramifications of that can be very, very impactful on the business. There are many acquisitions historically that had tremendous industrial logic um, but the cultural fit and the human element didn't work. And these acquisitions were not successful at the end of the day. So I would say uh, when we're looking at investing or at acquisitions, uh, we tend to focus a lot on the human element. Okay. Um, let's, uh, let's stick on education as a theme here. Um, do you think that we have the right institutions in place for education in America? Um, is, and maybe more generally, is it, um, do we have the right institutions in place for education around the world? Let, let, let me start in America first, because I'm a bit more conversant about education in America than opining about global education. Um, I wrote in a piece that, that I published recently in the last few months that in the US, we need a real resurgence in the manufacturing sector. Uh, globalization has gone through different phases. And one phase I discussed was China, the manufacturer for the world and shipping finished goods and then getting back sort of the waste. And that phase took you know a few decades if you look in the US of the last four or five decades, rough math, manufacturing sector has gone from 18 to 20% of GDP, closer to 10 to 12. And the service sector has just exploded in growth. And conventional wisdom related to education has been, you know, send as many kids as possible to four year colleges, let them get grad degrees. This is where the future is and they should work in the service sector and that's where the opportunity sits. And I think we as society have paid a dear price for that with less manufacturing, less supply chain in, in, in the US. I think higher education and what Virginia Tech offers is absolutely fabulous. And I talked about the breadth of the institution and the different fields and, and areas of expertise that one can garner at a place like Tech. I do think there is more room for maybe technical colleges, two-year programs to also train people, you know, for better warehouse jobs, for better manufacturing jobs. So we can reinvest back in the manufacturing sector. And I think we missed a few steps in the last few years. So in education, I'd love to see uh, more investment in certain technical know-how and training for employees. And I would also love to see companies, you know, pay better wages in manufacturing, pay better, better wages for machine operators, so that the manufacturing sector itself can thrive 
and people can feel there is a great opportunity for me if I've decided to have a career in, in manufacturing, making certain goods, not just being in the service industry. I hope this is something that maybe post COVID, we will see more of an investment behind it. Um, and I think what our manufacturers and, 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 and people who work inside factories do is absolutely phenomenal. I will tell you during the past year in COVID as CEO of a company where all my office guys went virtual and my guys who are in, in factories across the globe took more risk, showed up every day in our factories, made and shipped our product. Uh, I have expressed tremendous amount of gratitude and thanks to those guys working in our factories because they were the ones that were carrying us as a company and we gave them more financial incentives. And I would love to see more CEOs and more companies reward that behavior. But I think education, Robert, can play a big deal because we could have different forms of degrees, different forms of uh, you know, training so that people are ready for the workforce. The four-year degree is absolutely phenomenal and gives people tremendous opportunity. I don't think it's the only path. Now, if you go globally, uh, and I'm not, again, super conversant in, in the education system in Asia, et cetera, but I will tell you in Europe, in places like Switzerland, et cetera, you see what I'm talking about quite a bit, where people go to a 12 or 18 month program, garner a skill set, and they go into manufacturing, and they end up doing very well and achieving great goals and financial security. And I think that's something we should think about more in the United States. Maybe apprentice programs as well. Was that uh, something else you might support? Absolutely. Okay. You know. Well, your uh, answer has uh, spawned a couple of questions related to extra reading that the students could do. And so we got a question asking uh, if you could tell us where you published that, uh, that article. And I think I read it just uh, not too long ago. It's yeah, it was published on CNN.com. Yeah, maybe we can uh, get the, the link to that out to our, our audience. Of course. And then uh, someone else is asking if you've got book recommendations that would be related to sustainability <laughs> for whether it's climate or whether it's uh, packaging and uh, material uh, conservation. Any, anything you want to recommend, Omar? I, I'm not going to recommend the climate or, or packaging. I'm going to recommend a book that really impacted me um, a while back as I became very senior and started running companies and it's called The Outsiders. And it's a book about, I forget, maybe 10 or 12 different CEOs. Each chapter is about a CEO. And the common theme about all of them is they were iconoclasts, they were outsiders, they were not people that spent four decades in an industry and then became a CEO. And they had a real fresh perspective when they sat in the CEO seat and ended up having huge impacts on the companies that they led. And their way of thinking was differentiated and, and that ended up being rewarded. Maybe that's why when I looked at the climate issue, I've decided to focus more on materials instead of energy, electric vehicles, electrification, where I thought so many people are focused on that. Let me focus on something as important in my mind, but a bit less traffic. Uh, but that book I, I enjoyed. I would encourage anybody who wants to be an entrepreneur and ultimately in a business leadership position uh, to read that book carefully. Okay, well, I've written it down and I bet our students <laughs> as well. Uh, so here's a question. Um, should businesses and other institutions that were around and perhaps benefited from the labor uh, of slavery be held responsible for reparations to ancestors of those who were enslaved? Yeah, look, I'm not sure I'm qualified to sort of, you know, address that. It, 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 it's a big issue. I will tell you just my personal style is we all look forward and we all improve what we can going forward as much as possible. 
Um, so I'll leave it to more people who are sophisticated and closer to this topic to discuss the history and reparations and what should be done. I am a big believer in diversity and inclusion. I'm a big believer in giving a lot of people opportunities equally. Um, I think all of us can do a better job to deliver a better world. And by the way, that is our goal of our companies. And when I make personal investments, it's always about how do we combine doing well with doing good and delivering a better world. And part of that, uh, you, you know, is much bigger than just the climate and sustainability. It includes diversity and inclusion. It includes how to address community needs, society needs, income inequality. There are just so many facets. And I believe business can be a force for good. And to be honest with you, my mission for any business I'm involved with is to be a force for good. Okay. Uh, a question relating to carbon sustainability. Um, one of our audience members thinks that there's been a lot of uh, carbon sustainability that's been achieved by, by planting or preserving trees or having other people do that to get credits as opposed to doing something that actually reduces pollution or uh, increases recycling. So do you think that that strategy of having uh, trees preserved or planted is a, is a good long-term strategy for preserving? So, sustainable forestry is very important. So as we're doing forestry to do it in a sustainable way, with replanting trees. This is the beauty of trees. You know, they're natural, they're renewable. It's very important. Carbon uptake of forests is a very important topic. So to me, I am very focused on that, very supportive of that. Uh, I think the only thing I would add, I am not sure, given the issues we are facing on this planet and the severity of the climate, if you will, issue, that there is one solution for it. I would continue to promote that there are a number of good things that we can do and we should strive to do all of that. So whether it's planting trees, you know, increasing the carbon uptake of, of forests, using less fossil fuels, using more renewable energy, frankly, trying to use less energy, being efficient in our electricity, uh, being efficient in our water usage, in our waste management, that there isn't one solution. A complicated problem like this um, is gonna require a lot of different approaches. And if each one of those approaches is incrementally positive, collectively, you, you, you know, we will have a pretty material impact in terms of addressing climate issues. It took us a long time to get to where we are. We're not gonna fix it overnight. And we're not going to fix it in one strategy, but I am absolutely in favor of planting trees, sustainable forestry. That's the only thing we do. And I, I of course, I mean, the science is there. I'm a believer in the carbon uptake of, of forests and the role that they play there. Right. Thank you. Um, what is the most important change you've made since becoming CEO of Randpack or maybe a previous company that you led? I think the most important decisions you make as CEO is who you surround yourself with, who you promote, who you hire, um, and sort of what you do on the people front and the message that sends to the rest of the organization. Uh, I believe in the last two years, what I am most proud of at Rampac is the team that we have and the talent that we brought into the company and how we expanded our footprint uh, and our collective belief, if you will, in ESG and in sustainability. It is impossible to do the things I'm talking about if you're the only one who believes in it and there isn't a team that shares that, those values, shares that vision. But I really think as, um, as a CEO, I say the two most important things any CEO does is capital allocation, 
where they're investing capital, and then human and resource management, how they are managing the human element of business. And in many cases, these two things are interrelated. As CEO, I look at myself as a steward of my shareholders' capital and as a steward of the careers of all my employees and teammates. And to me, if you focus on these two things, I think they'll guide you to make the right decisions. Okay, well, continuing on the idea of a team leading a company, um, we've got a question about how diversity affects performance and maybe uh, how it's affected uh, if it has RANPAC. So how does the diversity on boards or in some of the top management positions of a company affect performance in your opinion? And then how much diversity have you achieved at RANPAC? We're still at the beginning of our journey. We want to deliver more uh, and achieve more when it comes to diversity. Uh, diversity has a lot of different facets to it across a lot of different you, you, you know, areas, more women representation across race, you know, sexual orientation, you, you name it. There's a lot of different ways, uh, ethnicities and so on. I will tell you, as someone who deals with a diverse group of people and where we're increasing diversity, it is different perspectives. If you have people around you that have the same experience that you have, that have the same perspective that you have, you don't need you know, 20 of them telling you what you already know. There is tremendous value in getting different perspectives, different views, different departure points, et cetera. And to me, that makes companies a lot more rich and robust, and I see it in action all the time. But let me, let me add something that I think is important. You know, I added more diversity at our board, in our senior team, and we're certainly more focused in, in the whole company to add diversity there. We don't add diversity because we just wanna add diversity. We look for very talented, very driven individuals. We look for people who can add a lot of value. And we look for people who can bring tremendous, you know, competence and drive to our company. If you have these as your guiding sort of principles, the outcome is going to be a diverse workforce because drive, commitment, hard work, capabilities, they come in different shapes or forms. So we are not doing diversity and inclusion because it's popular and because that's what the world wants us to do. No, no, we are seeking the best talent, but we're pretty honest and open that in order to get the best talent, you have to be open-minded and the outcome is a more diverse workforce. And that makes companies better. Because sometimes I hear people talking about diversity and inclusion and, and acting like that's you know, the focus. The focus is get the most talented people. The outcome will be more diverse and more, inclus more inclusive workforce. All right, we're uh, getting close to the end of the uh, half hour here. So I'm gonna ask two more questions, Omar. Sure. Uh, and I'm sorry, we'll have some questions that we haven't, uh, we haven't gotten to, but let me give you a couple of good ones here. <clears throat> so you talked about um, sustainability efforts at RANPAC in terms of packaging. Do you feel that some of the uh, largest companies in the world like Amazon and Walmart are doing enough to support sustainable packaging? I think companies truly care. I think companies are trending the right way. I am, I am very, very bullish and very encouraged by what I hear from senior management at large companies and at small companies and medium-sized companies. Um, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you everybody is doing everything they can. We can all do better. Frankly, myself, Rampak, we could do a bit better the trend is very, very positive. Uh, I have been sitting in the CEO seat for the last two years, and I'm comfortable telling you today, the conversations I have around sustainability, eco-friendly solutions, how to do things the right way for the climate are significantly better than just two years ago. 
are we where we need to be as society and as big and small companies? No, it's, it's a work in progress, but we are trending the right way. And that gives me the comfort in my opening remarks to say, I firmly believe this is gonna be the biggest theme this upcoming decade, because I see it in action each and every day in my conversations with big customers, big companies, small companies, there is a focus on doing things in a more sustainable fashion. And we all should be encouraged by that and strive to do more and more each day because we frankly need to. Well, um, very true. And, uh, you know, companies big and small and the university itself is, is trying to move in the right direction. Absolutely. We need to move fast. Yeah, <laughs> we do. Hi, right, Omar. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end on a question that you touched on a bit during your opening remarks. Um, but that is uh, something that I, I think our students in the audience will be able to relate to as they're about to start their careers. Tell us how your personal and professional goals have changed since you graduated from Virginia Tech. You, you, you know, uh, the world is not, it's not a linear place. Things don't sort of fall into place and go according to plan all, all the time. Uh, I think at Virginia Tech, you, you know, I learned a lot. Uh, I was driven. I was, you, 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 you know, very motivated. And I think that continued. And, and I would say the biggest, the biggest, word I would use is, is sort of being curious and curiosity. And to your question, Robert, about what other courses, what other advice do you have for people? I, I, I think if, if people are curious, and I think if they follow their passion, good things will happen. It is very tough to be curious about something that you're not interested in. So I think as I reflect on the last three decades after Virginia Tech, uh, you know, I had a lot of curiosity at school and then I had a lot of curiosity after school. And when I pursued things that I was curious about, that I wanted to learn more about, somehow dots got connected and, and good things happened. So to me, I would encourage students keep prodding, Keep prodding the universe, keep asking questions, keep seeking information, read what you're interested in reading, talk to people, learn from people. Somehow all that information will come together and yield a very good outcome. But definitely, definitely be curious because to me that is the most important ingredient. Be curious. Sounds like great advice. <laughs> Omar, um, thank you again for being part of Ethics Week. I know that our students appreciated you spending some time with them and giving them some, some pretty candid and thoughtful remarks and responses to their questions. I wanna thank the audience and everyone who made uh, tonight possible, especially Kim Carlson, Director of the Business Leadership Center and Debbie Kinawali, Head of our Management Department where the center is located. This concludes our event. Uh, everyone, please have a, a great rest of the evening. Still nice out there. Thank you, everybody. Okay, bye.